Our text this morning comes from the Gospel of Mark, selected verses beginning at verse 9. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God has come near, repent and believe in the good news. They went to Capernaum and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. As soon as they left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and then the fever left her, and she began then to serve them. That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons, and the whole city was gathered around the door. And he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons, and he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is searching for you. He answered, Let us go on to the neighboring towns so that I may proclaim the message there also, for that is what I came out to do. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So, what does it say about your team if your mascot is a dove? (laughs) We had a campus ministry activity this past Friday night, and when with them, I went with them to play a laser tag. It was from nine to midnight. I said goodbye about 9.45, I think. (laughs) For the game, everyone uh, gets assigned a name. There was Thunder and Warlock, Wolverine, Blade, Cobra, Menace, Wild Boar. I was assigned Ninja. No doves. <laughs> we prefer the bulldogs, the lions, the bears, the gators, the ravens, the eagles, the hawks. I mean, why didn't one of those animals descend upon Jesus after his baptism? A little more impressive. When colleges think about choosing the, their, their mascots, they usually want to represent power or, or conquest or aggression or domination. So I came across this week the mascot for UC Santa Cruz. Anyone know what their mascot is? Huh? The banana slugs. Listen to a few of the comments uh, on their website. The banana slug, a bright yellow slimy shellless mollusk commonly found on the redwood forest floor, was the unofficial mascot for UC Santa Cruz co-ed team since the university's earliest years. The students' choice of such a lowly creature was their response to the fierce athletic competition fostered at most American universities. UCSC has always offered a wide-ranging physical education and recreation program designed to appeal to the greatest number of students, but it has based its approach on some very uncommon ideas that athletics are for all students, not just team members of major sports. They feel that the most important goal of a collegiate physical education department should be to introduce as many students as possible to lifelong physical activities, and that the joy of participating is more important than the pleasures of conquest. Now, I like athletic competition, so you're not going to convince me that it <laughs> doesn't have its place. But I do appreciate the reminder. In 1980, when the school joined Division Three of the NCAA in five sports, the application required an official team name. And UCSC's chancellor at the time selected a new mascot for the school, the Sea Lions. 
While the chancellor considered sea lions more dignified and suitable to serious play than banana slugs, the new name did not find favor, though, among the students. So even after a sea lion was painted in the middle of the basketball floor, you could still hear students shouting at games, Go slugs! Go slugs! <laughs> So finally, in 1986, after a vote of the student body, the chancellor relented and made the lowly beloved banana slug UCSC's official mascot. So maybe when the Spirit descends upon Jesus as a dove, we ought to take that as a sign of some sort. That it, maybe it means something that sometimes is missed in the common message when discussing Jesus. I did not come to conquer or eliminate or dominate or control. Maybe that was the message. I came to help the world put down their swords and their spears. Dove, the symbol of gentleness and peace. Quite a contrast contrast to Constantine's vision of the cross made out of a sword and a spear with the words, conquer, conquer, by this. So we continue in our series of conversations on Jesus and our world of cultural and religious diversity. We're asking how might we remain dedicated and committed to following Jesus, but view that as a way not to lead us to supremacy or arrogance, but rather to humility and hospitality. And, and not just out of duty, but truly from the heart. Not just because, you know, we're supposed to be nice, because we're told to be nice, but because we view it as part of our understanding of who God is in the world. In verse 35 of our text, uh, Jesus goes out to pray. And the disciples are looking for him. And they say to him, look, everyone's looking for you. Where are you? Where'd you go? And his response is, let us go to the neighboring towns as well, so that I may proclaim the message there also. For that is what I came out to do. Let's go tell them the good news also. That's what I'm supposed to do. And Mark tells us earlier what that message is. Might be a little odd for us. And we need to probably read through all of Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John to really get a full picture of it. But this was the message. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God has come near. So Capernaum, or those folks who had experienced all those great, wonderful miracles just earlier, wanted to make him their private miracle worker. Everyone is looking for you. Come on back. There are more people who need to be touched. But he said, in essence, look, this isn't just for them. Not just for them. It was good news. It was the announcement that the kingdom of God is here among us, but it's for all, not just for us. So let me make a couple of observations. The New Testament books, and most importantly, the ministry of Jesus took place before there was a religion called Christianity. Am I right about that? Okay. I know that's obvious, sort of, but sometimes we forget, and that's a distinction that's sort of very important for us to realize and pay attention to. I'm going to tell you why in a minute here. The good news, this, this message of a present kingdom, was not the teaching of a particular religion as Jesus was presenting it but rather a foundational message of a revolutionary movement. And the revolutionary part is that it wasn't a message just to or for the Jews. Or any other private group for that matter. It didn't bypass the Jews, but it included more than the Jews. The full name for Galilee, anybody know what the full name for Galilee was? Galilee of the nations. It was, the, it was a cosmopolitan area. It was a famous major highway connecting Egypt and Mesopotamia called the Way of the Sea. 
Capernaum was right on the road. Capernaum lived right on the main highway. It's like your house having I-80 as its street address, you know? Soon I've looked at some of those houses. Uh, <laughs> we weren't interested. <clears throat> but it was home to many other, cult many cultures, many different religions. It was, it was uh, flowing with diversity. There's a reason that Jesus didn't go to Jerusalem to begin his ministry. Isn't that kind of curious? Instead, he went to Galilee. His message wasn't just for the Jews. It's, it's important because when you, when you talk about the message of a movement, it's very different than when you're presenting the doctrines of an organized religion. Just think about the differences between presenting the thoughts and ideas and message of a movement versus the doctrines of an organized religion. As a movement, there's no organization to promote or protect. It's not insider information. The message isn't insider information for those who are a part of our group, because there's no group. There's, there's no inside with a movement. Inevitably, Christianity will become a religion, and as such, it will be susceptible to all of the other typical kinds of uh, problems that religions tend to confront. But the teachings of Jesus, when they become a part of a religion, risk losing this radical universal appeal and become instead the message and the teachings of the in-group. They become oppositional as opposed to universal. We don't pay attention as much to that distinction, and it's an important one to, to remember. When Jesus made his way through the first century world, preaching his message of love and forgiveness and the coming of his kingdom, the presence, really, of his kingdom, nowhere do we see him promoting or endorsing or sanctioning any one religion over any other, even his own. Illustration. Jesus meets a woman at a well. He's in Samaria. The woman is a Samaritan woman. Samaritans were viewed as a, as a false religion by the Jews of, the, of his day. Um, <clears throat> Jesus meets her and begins to talk with her and may have this discussion with her, which is just interesting in and of itself, because when the disciples come back and they see her doing this, they're surprised, remember? They're kind of surprised by it. And, and there's a little sentence there that says, for Jews had no dealings with the Samaritans. They were the wrong group. <laughs> they were the, they're the group you're not supposed to talk to. But Jesus had this very, and if you remember the discussion, had this very open, interactive, and very personal conversation with her about her life. But I want you to notice that nowhere at any time in the conversation do we see him try to convert her to Judaism. That's very important to notice. That wasn't what he was thinking. Or does he even try to argue that Judaism is superior? And the same is true when you look at Jesus encountering a lot of other outsiders. You see him do the, basically the same thing over and over and over again. In fact, she's the one who brings up religion, if you look at that Samaritan woman conversation. Now, he doesn't just give blanket approval to religion, even his own. He knows how susceptible all religions are to power and control and discrimination and arrogance. He confronts that in all religions, with all people. So I understand this. It's not just giving sort of a blanket acceptance and uh, approval of the way sometimes religions do business. So here's Jesus talking with a Samaritan woman, and she uh, decides to uh, present something she's heard, argued her whole life probably. She says, our, answer, our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, meaning Mount Gerizim, but you say, the Jews, 
that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. She brings up a very common oppositional kind of challenge. Who's right here? We say we should worship on this mountain, but you guys say it should be on that mountain. Who has the right religious view? I mean, that kind of conversation is why most people don't like talking about religion. <laughs> you don't talk about a couple things, right? Yeah, right. It's that oppositional sort of way of seeing. Now, Jesus could have very easily, I mean, my goodness, he was a scholar. He could have whipped out his Bible to prove to her that worship only can happen in Jerusalem and that your worship in Mount Gerizim is wrong and that, and that the, uh, the best thing you could do right now is turn from your false religion and come with us back to Jerusalem and convert to Judaism. That's what you ought to do. Then you'll be accepted into the kingdom, but he doesn't do that. It's not the notion of conversion that Jesus is after. Instead, he says, woman, let me tell you something. The hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. He says it's not about who's most right, which kind of shocked her. This is what really turned the tide for her. Everything she heard about religion was about being most right. Who's most right? Who's correct? Because you're the winners. And Jesus says, that's not the important thing here. For the hour is coming and now is now here. That's kingdom of God. The same thing. The kingdom of God is among you. Okay, that's what he preached even in Mark 1. The hour is coming and is now here. Same thing. When the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. In other words, it won't be about the correctness of your religion, but about something that pierces within all cultures and all religions and something that flows to your heart and from your heart. Very different approach to the message of Jesus. A way of thinking that transforms your own religion from being oppositional to being hospitable. A way that, that moves them from that private club mentality. That it won't be, uh, it won't be about uh, being part of the superior group. It will be about God's love for all. His spirit in all. His truth over all. It'll be about God's truth and God's spirit in you as a human being. <laughs> if Jesus were speaking today, he might say this. It won't be about being a Christian or a Jew or a Muslim or a Sikh or a Hindu or about who's most right on which subject. He won't, he, he, I can imagine him saying, it will be about something that happens in your heart. No matter what group you're a part of, it will be worshiping God in spirit and in truth. That was the message of Jesus. That's what it means to follow Jesus. Recognizing the truth of God's kingdom on earth that includes us all. Transforming all of our arrogance and hostility into hospitality. And all religions can fall prey to the attitudes of superiority and arrogance. And our mountain is better than your mountain kind of thinking. We all can do it. But that's not the Jesus way. That's not the Jesus truth. And that's not the Jesus life. The kingdom of God is not about one religion dominating over another, even if that religion is Christianity. And maybe especially if that religion is Christianity. We may be using the name of Jesus to do that. We may be using the name of Jesus, to show ourselves superior. But, we, but if we do do that, we are not 
following or proclaiming the person or the message of Jesus when we do. That is not the kingdom he came to announce. That is not the practice he used. How easy it is for the good news of the gospel to be hidden by the very religion that bears its name. Love and compassion for all must accompany love and acceptance and compassion for me. It's not my gospel. God proclaimed in the person of Jesus that he grabbed a hold of all of us in the world. That's the good news of the kingdom. Remember, as a movement, we can't forget the message of a movement that infiltrated the world, not just developed a religion that could get it all right. We don't ever fully digest that kind of love very easily, um, but he keeps reaching to us through all of our life experience that in time we might come to live, not just know in our heads as a formula, God loves me and you, but that we would learn to live loved, that we would learn learn to live that way, live free, live forgiven, live in compassion in our hearts. So how do we move from hostility to hospitality? How did Jesus do it? How did Jesus maintain his commitment to God and yet maintain an openness and hospitality towards others who were very unlike him? He came to proclaim a universal truth, humble love, the love of a dove. And that's how we define commitment. Love that went beyond my group. Maybe the way we view others is the best way to determine whether we're following Jesus. Maybe. He celebrated diversity rather than trying to eradicate it. He didn't try to talk this woman out of not being a Samaritan or when she brought all, all of her friends, she didn't try to talk them out of being a Samaritan. He spoke beyond the differences to the core of what they all had in common. Because in the end, in the midst of all the great diversity that we experience in culture, all the great diversity, wonderful diversity that we experience in the world, we are all human. (laughs) All born into different cultures or ideas, but we all have similar needs and feelings and struggles and fears. The woman at the well had relationship problems. The demoniac had anger issues. The leper was isolated and alone. The rich young ruler was empty and lost in all of his money. The Roman centurion had a servant who was sick. Zacchaeus was dealing with guilt. The hemorrhaging woman felt hopeless. The disciples felt scared. They were all human. And the kingdom of God comes to humans. And the kingdom of God included them. They were all welcome guests in the kingdom Jesus came to proclaim. A kingdom that no one owned or controlled, but into which they were all welcomed to live. Jesus reaches out to our common identity. Whatever it is for us today, you're sitting here, you may be feeling your humanity really powerfully today. But just like in Samaria, God reaches to us as his beloved child, not because of our religion, but because of that common humanity. We too are invited to see it and trust it, that the kingdom of God is among us. And we're invited to enjoy it, even as Gentiles. But even as Gentiles, we are part of his kingdom. Even as messed up and faulty Christians, were included in his kingdom. And the Muslims and the Jews and all people over all the world were invited, no matter who we are, to go grab hold of a God who has already grabbed hold of us. Go doves.
In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.